Thanks for your talks. Very interesting. Let's get back into the questions. So there was um, one question, and it's it's directly linked to the question of anonymity. Um, physical cash allows anonymous payments. Is there a requirement on the eCrona project, but of course also on CBDC, uh, to support anonymous payments as well? And of course, if so, how could that be facilitated? Is there an answer to that question? <laughs> Should this, it be facilitated? Yeah, no, this work. Okay. Well, I mean, it's not a problem if you have a like we were we were touching on in the end of the Danish talk. It's like we all have EIDs in the Nordic countries. So if you you can easily on uh, you can identify any payments anywhere. So it's oh, cash is always going to be the one that is most discreet if you want to do discreet payments. But if you want control payments, then uh, if it's a blockchain opportunity, you authenticate yourself with the EID that you have, usually on monitored by the phone. So did that answer the question? Or did I misunderstand the conversation? Maybe just if there's a technical possibility for CBDC to, be, to become actually anonymously, because cash is anonymous, uh, but is there a possibility? You said you don't have an answer. Don't but yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's always a card, so someone owns it. But quite apart from the technical question, is uh, there is a problem, is that even if it was technically possible, are people going to believe you? Right? And if they don't believe you, no. there's no point in the first place. Okay. Um, the next question, um, could a non-interest bearing CBDC work? Uh, this would then function in the same way as cash. So basically having a risk-free digital money, why should it have an interest being paid on it? And what are maybe the dangers? You already touched upon it maybe a little bit. Yeah, there's a lot of misconceptions in, in, in that space. I think, you know, uh, we are using a money. That, let's think about the time before the crisis when interest rates were somewhat higher. And uh, in the UK, at least, you would get interest on your bank deposit, especially if it's a time deposit, but even checking deposit. You would get interest on it, right? Because people are willing to live with less interest on their account than on a risk-free investment like a government security or something because of what is known as the convenience yield. They're willing, they're willing to live with that. But the, their convenience yield has a certain size, right? Uh, and if you're, if you're just saying it's zero that I'm paying, uh, then it's not, they, 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 this may not con uh, accord with the convenience yield that, uh, that, that, that people actually feel there is, right? The interest rate on uh, risk-free securities could be 3%. People would be willing to live with uh, uh, two percent less interest if you're paying zero. Then the, the demand is going to be heavily affected by that, right? So you, you and so, yeah. But obviously, we're giving away four percent of all the payments that we do today, since we're using credit card structure as we have, and we agreed to that. So I don't know. It's easier to take out cash and put it in your bed and use that rather than paying for cash stuff rather than what we're agreeing to today. We have a minus. Yeah, yeah, that's why I was now. arguing. That's yeah. why I was arguing about an earlier period. Yes. So in the, in the equivalent regime, if you want to replicate the current outcomes, you would pay on CBDC exactly the same interest rate as to, that you pay now on deposits. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. That's if they are perfect substitutes. If they're if somewhat they're imperfect exactly. substitutes, exactly. then no. Uh, again, I, 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 I don't talk about the uh, if uh, CBDC should have interest rate during the transition because you have the banking uh, money, you have unsafe money and so on, and that creates a lot of problems. But on the steady state, on the final state, I see some uh, advantages of not paying interest because you divide clearly what is a financial asset that is everything what is not money i mean and and you don't pay ma you don't pay interest rate because money is a safe asset and then interest rate is a compensation of risk then in, in the final state i am not talking about the the, the the problems of the transition because they are very very complicated and i could uh, uh, agree with uh, during certain time no but if you have divided what is because the problem the, the good thing for me in having saved money is that now we have a, a money that is a financial asset, it's a risky asset. 
then it could have an interest rate. But if you divide that, it's, a, it's a, uh, for all people knows that when he leaves or they leaves the, the central bank and lend or make other contract and so on, they are entering in risk. And then there are remuneration there, but not in money. Money has not remuneration. Um, I, I think I can see that point, but imagine the following scenario. Let's, let's say the risk-free interest rate, the policy rate right now is 3%, and then suddenly there's a, a huge uh, change in monetary policy. The risk-free interest rate goes up to 5%, 6%. Suddenly the opportunity cost of holding CBDC goes up enormously, and therefore there's a huge swing in demand, which is going to go through all the balance sheets in the economy that are going to have to quantity adjust to this change in the opportunity cost. And I think... Uh, changing prices rather than changing the quantities is less risky in a situation like that. And that's why it would be good to have an adjustable interest rate. Well, talking with, uh, with Michael, I am <laughs> I'm not an academic, but my view is the following. If you allow the interest rate to be fixed in the market, lenders and, uh, and, and investors, you will have an interest rate. And then the problem that you are, how I see the problem you are mentioning, is a problem that, of course, the, the, the central bank or whatever, the, the, the entity that decides monetary policy should decide if you need to, to increase the amount of money because you want to reduce interest rates because you have different effects or probably not because you are increasing spending and so on and so on. And then it will be a, dec a decision of the monetary policy that you should decide to increase the quantity of money. But you don't need to use... I mean, I think that we are, uh, we are uh, thinking that the only possibility of manage uh, monetary policy is controlling and manipulating interest rates. And I think that in the, in the steady state, I continue, not, not during the, the transition, you could uh, use the quantity of money, I mean, and you could increase more. Of course, you could do the, on the other side, when you have enough money, the central bank could uh, uh, issue a central bank uh, deposit and so on, but not related. It's not money. It will be a financial asset by, provided by the central bank. But I don't see the necessity of doing anything other distinct than a good monetary policy. Can I, so I, I, I'm not sure I understand the distinction between uh, uh, you know, setting interest rates and setting quantities. I mean, one, one implies the other, unless you want to have an exchange rate between these different monies, right? So of that's, course. that seems difficult. And I think no, no, of course, of course you, you have an influence. I mean, when you are increasing spending directly, of course, you could increase the spending, consumer, or in the parliament, or investment, no? because you are giving that money, or the parliament, or the, or the different clients, different uh, consumers. And of course, that will have an impact in the people that receive that money and will reduce if you are increasing the interest rates. But it's different that you see a result that, of course, will, be, uh, will have to be taken into account in the Committee of Monetary Policy. You will have to have into account what is the effect in the increasing spending, the decreasing interest rates and so on, and decide what you have to do. But this is different than to have, of having a policy interest rate. It's different because the interest rate that will be not one interest rate, will be thousands of interest rates, will be uh, decided by the market. Well, I think this discussion leads us exactly to the next question. And uh, I think it's also a part of the discussion about the different designs. So you could either design a central bank digital currency, which is proactively created by the central bank, which goes more into the direction of Michael's model, for example, but also only to reactively, just like physical cash right now, um, so to say, where, where bank depositors can withdraw their money digitally into CBDC. So the question now is, why should uh, private banks, private companies create the money supply and why shouldn't the state just uh, take it back, so to say? That's what we've been discussing all day. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's a different uh, model design, I think. So uh, because, um, Morten, you were talking about more about the withdrawing and 
reactively uh, creating CBDC and this approach is more about proactively creating it and uh, if so, how it could be proactively created. And what are the benefits of letting private companies create most money? Well, I, as I understand the discussion in central banking circles, I mean, this is not really about controlling the money supply. Currently, we just supply the amount of, of notes and coin that, that people want to hold. Uh, the central bank, uh, the, the, the commercial banks grant loans, uh, which also leads to, to deposits, which is denominated money. I suppose that but what most people think about as a CBDC will also be something which is supplied flexibly. So if you have, if you go down to, to the bank to take out the loan, you get a deposit in your bank account, then you can sub subsequently uh, move that into CBDC into the central bank. So it would, I would see it as a kind of deposit taking institution in line with, with, other, with other commercial banks without an, 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 a kind of an objective to controlling the stock of money or the supply of money. That's at least how I, how I understand the discussion in the, also if you read the IMF and, and the BIS uh, notes. Yeah. I mean, this goes, this always goes back. We've been, the last five minutes, we've basically been discussing a version of the pool model, right? Uh, do you have a money market yeah. with a money demand and a money supply? And what's going to clear the market? Yeah. If I fix the quantity of money, then the interest rate in the market is going to clear it. If I fix the interest rate, like what you're suggesting, then the quantity is going to adjust. And that's a design question or pool concluded, uh, uh, controlling the quantity of money. And all the central bankers, most of the central bankers subsequently concluded that controlling the quantity of money was not a good idea because when you have money demand shocks, uh, that would really uh, disturb the real economy. And, and I, think, I think that's still conventional wisdom, right? Another question um, on uh, Dirk Niepelt. Uh, you argued that CBDC and bank deposits require the same resources. But is this really the case? For bank deposits, a large regu regulatory framework is needed. For CBDC, not. So is this really the case? Uh, I would say in the margin, it's the case. Um, you know, as a, as a deposit-taking uh, institution, you have to satisfy many regulatory requirements that cost resources, I agree, although they are negligible uh, relative to a country's GDP. But the question is, you know, what, what is the resource requirement at the margin if you want to replace a billion units of deposits against a billion units of CBDC or something? Does this significantly alter the resource requirement in the economy? And the answer is, I think, to a first order at least, it's clearly no. As opposed, if you want to think about, you know, replacing deposits by Bitcoin, for example, there I think the answer to the first order would be it does make a difference in resource requirements, right? Because um, if you have a um, proof-of-work concept-based um, 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 blockchain-based currencies, there's a lot of resource requirements that go into maintaining those systems, but it is not true <coughs> for a centralized managed payment system, be it deposit-based or CBDC-based. Okay. Um, would there be an option to use CBDC for tackling the problems of climate change? Printing money, you mean, though? That we should stop doing that? We still need to have... I think it's the reverse, actually. Because all of a sudden, if you're doing... You need to control a new system. If you're not building a new infrastructure, you have to... If we're stick on with blockchain, we have to have a stick that goes into new servers and, and all kinds of certain things, and the plastic money in itself, new cards and anything. We're still going to be doing the same thing. It's not going to be an environment better or worse, I think it would be better for anyone who wants to work towards a, another economy or a new economy, if you're sharing with no profit on it and so forth, then it would be better for the communities, absolutely. The non-bankers would be more interested, the ones that are not banked, but it's also, is it going to be a, um, is it going to be taxed, reviewed, What is, what is the structure of the funds? It's like who's going to, like you said before, is it going to be anonymous or not? Uh, is it going to be concluded into that you deposit your funds somewhere else and then you put it in like an extra wallet? It's just a matter of is this going to be the infrastructure or not? So I don't see an environment change in that. Um, okay. oh. No, go ahead. Impact, perhaps. I think if you hear people answering yes on that question, you should be very, very skeptical. I mean, no, this is the, the Green New Deal, this is MMT, whatever we see coming from the US. 
this is according to 99% of the people who understand a bit of economics, not serious stuff. So these are completely different subjects. Even if CBDC were to give you any uh, improvement in the allocation in the economy, which, which is conceivable, you could you know, attain that without doing anything on the climate side and the other way around. There's no immediate connection between these two things. To the extent that we won't flown into Stockholm today, we have actually contributed to the problem, but I think this is also second order for the question. Right? I, I, I think the question is, uh, perhaps, can I, can I try to... No, then I don't see the connection. Well, I mean, you can democratize it if you want to have a system for the unbanked, yes then it would be on an impact side. But I don't know if it has to the, with the climate to do, more rather than the social impact of uh, arranging people yeah. in the economy. Yeah. But, but I did want to, to continue on the spending a little bit. Uh, I mean, it, it all depends. It, you know, there's, there's two types of spending that you can think about here. For the economy as a whole, is it going to mobilize additional resources? And then fiscally, uh, because, you know, you might want to do some of that spending fiscally and that's a more narrow thing. For the economy as a whole, it depends on whether you believe the simulations in our model. Is it going to do something to real interest rates, to tax revenue that allows you to reduce distortionary taxes, to other distortions? Uh, is it, it, and if it's going to do that, then you are going to generate more resources that way, and then you can deploy those resources in certain ways. If you don't believe that, then we need to argue about that. But if you don't believe that, then that's not the case. But then you have the narrower fiscal case that uh, in this case, there would be a, a senior rush revenue for the government. If the government is spending constrained in what it can do, for example, about the environment, after that, it would have senior rush revenue that it could deploy. Um, and then the question is, do you want to use it on climate change, on sustainable society, on tax reductions, on paying down the debt? And that's like, it's, it's just a huge uh, uh, political uh, discussion, not a monetary discussion. Sure. No, because uh, uh, again, in the steady state, no, in the transition, one of the good things of uh, CBDC is that take out uh, the central bank and so on from the politi politics. I mean, the decision to support climate change is a political decision. The problem is that if we have the system we have now, of course, the decision of the central banks and central ba uh, and banks that have a lot of subsidies, they have the possibility to uh, go in this sense on the other. The advantage of having separated the money is that the central bank will be a kind of register and create money, but they have not the possibility to uh, interfere. Uh, uh, why? Because the lending will be decided by the market. Once the lending is, is decided by the market, you could have the parliament of throw to decide what you have to tax or subsidy climate change, inequality, small and medium enterprises. But the advantage is that you have take out that creation in the steady state all the money in the transition, not all the money, but that part is take out uh, from the, the political debate. Now there is a political debate because central banks and bark decide to take decisions political relevant. Another question, um, would you see an extended usage of SDRs or special drawing rights as an alternative to CBDCs? I mean, this is, this is um, a bit of the stablecoin model that Jon presented. Um, this is a bit of the stablecoin model that Jon presented in the morning, right? I mean, and Facebook is also aiming to do that. Yeah, right? so we have uh, the issue is some claims that are backed by a bunch of, of other assets, in that case, a bunch of other, you know, central bank monies. I mean, this is the, many a saga, I think, is trying to do this as well to some extent, I understand. So this is a, is a way to construct a synthetic CBDC that is not 
you know, it, it's not a currency board vis-a-vis -vis one currency, but it's a currency board vis-a-vis -vis a basket of currencies. So whether it's the, the SDR as the basket or some trade weighted basket or something else, it's, it's, yeah, it's possible for sure. Um, and maybe one uh, very general question, everybody touched upon it, everybody has different views on it. Is introducing a CBDC going to end in a digital bank run? Maybe some background on that. Uh, I recently looked into the figures and saw that through QE, now in the Eurozone, 36% of M1 is backed by central bank reserves. So if there was like a very dramatic shift, then uh, at least 36% needed to be shifted to make a, a severe crisis. Also, the central banks usually provide emergency liquidity as uh, um, assistance, so short-term loans. So you could actually argue, to my mind, um, that even though if there was a bank run, just like it could happen right now, uh, this could easily go back into the into the um, current uh, system where you hold deposits at, uh, at, at commercial banks. So is this threat maybe just... Uh, um, yeah, focused too much on. Well, that's a, that's what I try to to sketch with this Mickey Mouse model, right? It really believe it really depends on what you believe the central bank is going to do, accommodating such an introduction of CBDC. If you take the view that the central bank would be willing to stand ready and actually refund the banking sector, and then the question is subject to what conditions would they do it, then it's a non-issue by definition, because mechanically you just change the funding base, but you don't change the quantity of funding that goes into the banking sector. So, but then of course the question is really, would they be willing to do that, right? I mean, if you talk to central bankers, and I think you also mentioned that, uh, they would they would do like, are you crazy, right? Why should I extend so much funding to banks? And then even without uh, you know asking for collateral. So the question is, why do we have in the current system depositors providing funding to banks no collateral requirements, and at the same time, the public standing ready to provide land of last resort guarantees. So implicitly, now this funding is provided without collateral, but if you were to make it explicit through the Mickey Mouse channel I showed you, then most likely central banks would require collateral for that funding. So that is a source of non-neutrality, and you might debate whether, you know, why is this? Why is the current monetary regime such that we don't somehow ask for collateral? But once we make it explicit, we do ask for collateral. So there's, I mean, this is an open question. I don't know what the answer is, but there is a potential source of non-neutrality. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the, the second part of my talk was essentially about this question, right? I mean, uh, exactly. um, and I, I thought the way you treated it uh, was a little, it was a bit too casual, but I think it, now you qualified it, you know, uh, this, because this would be a run. I mean, you, you're describing this, oh, the central bank steps, steps in, but if you, if you read the newspaper the next morning after this happened, this is a catastrophe. This is a huge run uh, on the banking system where the central bank has to step in with potentially enormous emergency lending and perhaps, uh, perhaps actually not just temporary because potentially for a long time. And that's why uh, we suggested that there should be a circuit breaker, that there should be some convertibility limits that would not make it possible uh, for the, uh, or necessary for the central bank to take that role ad infinitum. I, mean, I think it's largely an empirical question to which we don't know the answer since we haven't introduced a CBDC yet. I think this takes place in, in two steps. So you, you sketch the current situation where the banks have uh, quite ample reserve that the ECB, at least the euro area banks have, of course, it differs uh, between jurisdictions. But then the first thing you would see would be that you would go towards some kind of, if we, we assume that we find a new equilibrium. Their deposits in the bank would probably be lower because some deposits have switched into the into the central bank. Depending on what, how you design this CBDC, it could differ. I mean, if you have, if you have an account-based CBDC, it will probably be in higher demand compared to a, a, a value-based CBDC where you could lose in the street and you lost your money. So, so already, once you have reached this new equilibrium, you would have uh, uh, less um, uh, deposits in the banks. And uh, then the next step is then that the run could suddenly occur so the first step you could probably manage, you can probably find some kind of new equilibrium. But then the risk is still that you could have a run which would come very suddenly. And that's the risk, and we don't know how, how likely it is, but it's potentially catastrophic if it happens. 
if you design the system badly. Mm. I, I insist yeah. on that. I insist. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but in, but sorry, in your in your situation, you say that the bank, the central bank, can say no. We don't want to convert any more deposits into CBDC. Yeah, because basically, in, in today's system, if you want central bank money, you've got to bring eligible assets, either yeah. as collateral or directly in exchange, right? Yeah. Uh, and all we're saying is that needs to continue with CBDC as well. So you can you can go to the central bank and say, I have a government security here that's an eligible asset today, yeah. and I can get CBDC for it, but I can't come with my bank deposit. But wouldn't you end up in a situation then when CBDC is in short supply, and then yes. the exchange rate of CBDC against bank deposits at, would then would then start adjusting, which exactly would also be a problem, at, I if you if you get I think if you had a, a circuit breaker in the system this way I think a run would be less likely in the first place and that's a, a good thing, but if if we just play through that scenario where it actually does happen these are your alternatives one is your alternative that first of all deposit rates will go up right yeah. because they're yeah. deemed higher risk if that's not enough the parity is going to break between yeah, CBDC yeah, and other forms yeah. of money what's your alternative your entire banking system is going yeah, down yeah, yeah. what are you going to prefer none of them yeah <laughs> <laughs> no CBDC. Um, another question that is a very broad question of course uh, it's I guess comes from the monetary former um, side of the room um, why should the only instruments to regulate inflation be to stimulate more debts which of course will lead to uh, instability How can we improve the system uh, when not issuing CBDC? So is there a way to decrease the debt uh, issuance and the debt relation uh, of money? So, so maybe I mis misunderstand the question, but uh, you, can, you can think about worlds in which there's zero debt, uh, but there's a unit of account in which we all think, the Swedish krona, and you can think about a normal interest rate, and the, the Riksbank regulates that interest rate, and that is the instrument to stimulate or not the economy. So there's no necessary collection, connection between stimulating or cooling down the economy and, and having debt. That's conceptually not there, that connection. But, but, but I, think, I, I think that probably you are thinking of the question that our current system needs debt to create money. And then yeah. the comparison with the CBDC, I, in my view, is one of the advantages that you don't need to oblige to create debt to create money. Mm -hmm. Then I, I don't know, but it's, it's my view. No? Yes. Yeah. I think the question went into that direction, if I understood it correctly. Um, in a world of flexible exchange rates, is it truly possible to have an ultimate safe asset in all currencies? So this goes basically back to if there is a safe asset and, yeah. Okay, nice. I think that's an interesting point because it comes up very often. So we don't have any safe assets in this world. There's zero safe asset in that world. In the end, Gosh. we as societies are exposed to whatever is on the asset side of the aggregate balance sheet of the economy. And this is capital and land and weather and whatever the assets are that we live in. So we might create pieces of paper, we might create accounting uh, entries and some ledgers, and we might consider individually that these are safe uh, bookkeeping devices, safe assets. There's no safety created by printing a piece of paper and writing on that paper that this is a, piece, a safe piece of paper. There's nothing of that type. And then there was a discussion also in the morning that um, you know by making money uh, just an asset of some all of the holders of the asset, but not at the same time a liability. So not having it backed by somebody else, but essentially making it a bubble. That's what it means to be the asset of somebody, but not the liability of somebody else. This is even much much more of a fragile object, right? It's not only a piece of paper that we all tend to believe in. It has some value. On top of that, there's nothing really backing it up except our common beliefs that this is valuable for some reason. So there's zero safety in that world, and we cannot create it by just running the printing press or running a computer. I, I don't understand that. I mean, when, when we have created these pieces of paper and we all know that we can use them in exchange and we have a GDP backing that up because the GDP requires that exchange, everybody knows that we need a certain quantity of exchange exchanges, then that money is going to have value. And, uh, you know, in a sense... If the central bank has government debt sitting on the asset side of its balance sheet, once you consolidate the government debt, that's basically, it's, it's not there, right? It's canceled. Once, this, once the central bank buys back government debt, uh, it is, it, that is what you just described, right? And so back, the backing of it is, uh, in some sense, what does it mean? 
right? Uh, so we are, we are dealing in those pieces of paper, and they're backed by GDP. They're backed by our need to transact. May, may, I, may I complicate a little? <laughs> <laughs> yes, because, uh, no, the idea of safety uh, of money, that is the idea of a store of value, has two meanings. One is the, uh, well, all the money have, that is the relation with prices. And then, in that sense, all money are not safe. But the advantage of CVDC uh, in relation of the uh, uh, using a private financial, uh, financial asset is that the private financial asset is not just risky for that, but it's risky because they could not repay the value at par. But the money, if you compare now the, uh, a physical uh, banknote uh, issued by the euro, it, it has the problem of uh, how much value you have according to the prices. But if you uh, have 50 euros in, in, a, in a banknote, you have 50 euros. But if you have 50 euros in a, uh, in a bank deposit, you don't know how, much, how many euros you could get. Uh, uh, except that the state include a lot of protection to warranty and to appear that it is not as unsafe because the state is... Then these, these two uh, notions of safety should be taken into account. It's a little complicated, but sorry. If you hold a piece of paper, a piece of paper is... The value of that piece of paper is as high as the next person is willing to give you, how many apples the next person is willing to give you in exchange for that apple. If the next person believes that she will not get another apple once she, once she wants to get rid of that piece of paper, that's it, right? It's, it's a, it depends on our common beliefs in society, how valuable money is. Trust in the Riggs Bank, for example, or whether you believe that somebody else is willing to accept that claim. It's not an apple. It's not a real asset. Trust is the word. Uh, but it does, it, it's not just a belief. I mean, I know that if I have that piece of paper, I had to spend less effort in order to buy something. I mean, let's say we have an economy which only has cash, just to make if it If somebody simple. accepts it. If somebody will accept it. Yeah, yeah, of course. But... You know, we, we, this is a social, money is a social convention. Exactly, that's yeah. the point. It's, yeah. So it's very fragile. I, I, don't, I don't see that. You're, the, the, you're talking about some anarchic society, but in a... Democracy backs it up. Democracy. Our, our, our society backs it up. Right. We work for the democracy. I, I know many countries in which people work very hard and somehow trust got lost in those currencies like this. Okay. So and they were not democratic mostly. That's correct. But I don't think that democracy. But well, maybe democracy is at the heart of that. But it's certainly a very fragile object. It's a piece of paper. In the end, it's a piece of. The point is, in the end, it's a piece of paper. And by printing more or less of that, you don't create real value. Um, another question: What the promise of a temporary and partial nationalization? of the failing banks prevent a bank run if we are using CBDC. So I guess this uh, faces the situation where a bank run is taking place and then as a counter, um, uh, yeah, as a, as a, as a um, yeah, should you partially uh, or temporarily nationalize the failing banks? So I think at the heart, these are two issues that relate to that. It's solvency and liquidity, right? I mean, nationalizing per se means that you change the ownership of that institution, which might improve incentives of the people that run the institution to get rid of liquidity issues that, that, that are at our, at our heart that we are concerned about. But once things happen, I think the nationalization per se doesn't resolve the liquidity issue. You still need the central bank to step in if you want liquidity to be provided and the payment system to be maintained. But it could help improving incentives of the people at the, at the helm of the institution. And uh, one argument that I have heard that's related to your question, question quite closely related, is that um, when we resolve banks today, uh, then typically the depositors of the institution that has to be resolved uh, uh, sometimes have to wait quite a while before, and hopefully eventually they can, before they can use their purchasing power again. It is stuck in the banking, in, in the bank that's being resolved. Uh, and I've heard the argument 
that if you have CBDC, you might be able to immediately let those people have access to their purchasing power in the form of CBDC and then resolve the troubled institution the way you would have done it anyway, but without people losing access to their purchasing power for that long. So that's a relevant consideration. Um, another, maybe last, uh, but I guess a bit complicated question. Would anybody el elaborate on the consequences of a flexible exchange rate between the SEK, so Swedish krona, and the e-krona, or other national currencies versus its central bank digital version? I'm not sure to what exactly you are referring with the uh, exchange rate, but um, if it is pressing, maybe, maybe you could uh, ask it or... I will choose another one. Okay, I count that as a no. Um, Morton, um, you argued that the public sector shouldn't compete with the private sector on the market, but isn't the monetary base the platform to the actual market? Should I repeat? Or, uh, so I understand the question. Uh, well. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a broader point on public sector versus private sector competition. I mean, there are lots of areas where you have some problems. I mean, you could argue that uh, the profitability of farmers is too high, the profitability of supermarkets is too high. You can't avoid supermarkets, you can't avoid uh, farmers, but you don't set up a state-owned supermarket to compete against uh, the other supermarkets. You don't set up a state-owned uh, uh, farm to compete against the other farmers, although you cannot really survive without food. You, you regulate, you, you encourage competition. And that's the same thing we do in the banking sector. And then to, to avoid some of these problems that we have seen over the last 10 years, and particularly uh, during the financial crisis, we have then strengthened uh, supervision and improved regulation. <clears throat> so I think that's, that's the way we are, we are trying to deal with these problems, that we're building a framework around the banks because they're very important institutions in our societies to assure that they actually operate in a way that benefits uh, society. That, that's, I mean, that, that's how we approach this. I think it's also a matter of innovation. If you look at it, in Denmark, we have a very well, we have a very efficient payment infrastructure, but it's not being owned by the central bank. It's a private uh, uh, payment uh, infrastructure. So central banks are not really innovators. Um, they're more like creating the framework. But I think also in Sweden, or uh, we're more famous, I guess, for having a blend economy. So we can do both, the government and then also private economy. And I think the mix of being able to work with them continuously together. I think we have an enormously successful banking system in Sweden. I dare to say that uh, even though the commercial banks are getting more and more annoyed over that you have to pay services for them and they lack the interest of, of developing, we now have an, an API opening due to the banking and the P PSD2 that we actually can add new innovation in towards the banking system, which is also then monetizing them on creating new values. And if you trade on, on money, for example, you can do that on blockchain and you can use the currency in the store, but you can also trade on the currency as many do. And I've done that it too, and it's successful and then it's not so successful. Mm. So I believe that there's different systems that can work together, but we need to make sure that if we're going to have a digital currency out from the, 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 not the Federal Bank, but Riksbanken here in Sweden, I think it should, could be regulated into a set value for that, not necessarily the same value, but how can you trade it then forward? And then the conversation is in a loop again, and we just continue to talk about the same things. But I don't think that that, I agree with Miguel, I like that system. And I like the, Martin, he said on the deposit of the non-profit stuff is also interesting for some people, but maybe not for everyone. Is, uh, well, is, is, I think that it is important, the question, because uh, the idea that in a CBDC, the central bank will have any capacity or in any task in, in, in service, in payment services, is absurd. I mean, what do you separate is money, creation and register. But the payment services will be provided by all competitors that they want. I mean, obviously, if they need a certain infrastructure, as happened now, no, you could provide and so on. But uh, the, the, the central bank will register 
and will create money, but they we don't provide any. Then, uh, in fact, it will be open more to competition. Mm. For instance, now the PSD2, that I think is a very good directive, no? the, uh, uh, have the problem that you have the banks there, but if uh, you could open more to competition, to payment services, is if are the deposits in the central bank, but of course credit card transferences and so on and so on, and every, every service payment will be made and, and the same lending, but lending is more more understood. But uh, uh, I think it is important to, uh, to to say that what you separate is money, not payment services. Okay. Well, I think we should stop here and get into uh, the coffee break, get some energy, maybe some uh, air here. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> <laughs>